Amazing. Well, Joe, I'm so excited for what's next. Um, we have uh, the pleasure of having a great panel of leaders who are going to join me right now. Um, and as we said earlier, this is your time, guys. Um, this is your time for the Q&A, um, for the panel. And even maybe if you heard anything that Daniel Copeland said or David Kinnaman said, that you'd really love to just have a broader understanding on, uh, we've got that Q&A chat function for you to be able to use and ask your questions. And we're going to try to get through as many questions as possible but please, please keep them flowing, keep them coming um, as we get into this panel. Um, I'd love to welcome you guys. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. It's such an honor and a pleasure to have you all. Um, how are you doing? Doing well. Thanks, Azamba. Amazing, yeah, amazing. Um, so for some of you here, these people are very, um, you know, familiar to you. But for some of you, maybe you like, who are they? I'm going to run you through some amazing bios really quickly. Um, we have Dan Blythe, who has served on staff team at Hillsong, leading the youth and young adults, and later the creative team. And he's now the global youth director for Alpha. And then we have Laura Hancock, who is the national ministries director for British Youth for Christ and has been doing youth work for 18 years in a variety of settings. And then we also have Dion Joel, who has been a young people's pastor at Hope Church for six years in George, South Africa. Um, so we have a plethora and amazing um, depth and um, widespread of wisdom here today. Um, and as I said, it's so cool to have you guys here. Thank you for making time. Uh, but I'm going to head off with some questions for you all. Um, and I'd love to... Um, to you, Dion, first of all, um, we've heard some great insight, great research, all of the things from uh, Daniel Copeland, from David Kinnaman, and even Christine Kane as well, which has been amazing. Um, for you, what has um, really caught your attention or maybe even challenged you or made you think differently about how teens um, are relating to Jesus right now? Wow, I, I think all of it was challenging. Thank, thank you to a uh, massive shout out to Daniel, maybe for putting together all that data. It was uh, I think sobering in, in many ways. I, I think we, we know it's, it's challenging out there. Um, to hear those figures was just like, in some ways, heartbreaking, but also challenging. And I think uh, listening to Christine Kane, uh, one of the things she said is, uh, has to have humility. Uh, you know, like <clears throat> for a leader who's been going at it for a while and, you know, post COVID, you're trying to figure things out. Um, I think with humility, I think we actually have an incredible opportunity to reimagine what community looks like, what commitment looks like, uh, the role of the church of looking after our young people and really caring for them yeah. and sharing what this good news is all about. And I think that's, yeah. that's, that's brilliant. So, uh, so some of the challenges are there, but, but what an opportunity, hey? Absolutely. So many opportunities. Feel very inspired to think outside of the box of how we're doing ministry every single day. So um, absolutely loved everything that was shared. Um, what about you, Laura? Um, you know, as you look at this generation, what really sets it apart from the previous ones? What's different about teenagers today? Yeah, lovely. So I'm a millennial and I remember being sat in youth events and youth venues with um, speakers going, you know, you can make a difference. You're generally, you, you as an individual will change this world. And um, I guess I kind of grew up believing that a little bit. And as I've kind of gotten older, I'm going, gosh, God, I thought you were going to do more in some ways. And wrestling through with that but I think the amazing thing about the generation underneath uh, with Gen Z is that they have tools tools that maybe other generations didn't have they are super connected they have a voice they have a desire to do and it's not just like a passion to do but they they see other young people doing and they see these good news stories of young people that do make a difference and have made a difference and this fires them up and they can find community in that and learn from each other and um I think there's something about, the, I think, I can't remember who said it, it, it may have been Christine, around um, just breaking down divides as well. And so this incredible connectivity means that they, they, they see the world differently, but they also have a voice mm -hmm. and they have tools in this world that maybe generations before them haven't had. What they don't have is experience. And I think as leaders, as the older generation, it is for us to maybe get out of the way quite quickly lend them our wisdom, lend them our experience so that they can use their tools well. Amazing, Laura. Um, and Dan, you know, what can we learn as leaders from this generation's 
uh, perspectives on, on the world? Like, how can we, what can we learn from them about like what they're showing us about this world? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think what Christine Kane said that they can really smell uh, if something's fake. And it's like, mm. you know, I just got the imagery of like sniffer dogs with the police. Like they've got a heightened sense of smell. That's why the police need them. And, you know, I think for us, one of the great things about this generation within the world that they can like just sniff out something that isn't real, that isn't authentic. Uh, and so I think it's really challenging, you know, for us as church leaders and people leading organizations that we do practice what we preach, um, mm -hmm. especially in the day where we put so much online with nice catchphrases. And, and I get it. We want to be able to have a messaging so people understand what we're about. But if they walk into our communities and young people don't experience what they're seeing, we're saying online, then there's there's faith, there's lack of authenticity. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, they are they are almost like the sniffer dogs, which are going to like lead the church into a much authentic, real, genuine place. And I think it's one of the greatest things that they have. It's a great gift. Incredible. Dan, you always have the most incredible analogies. That's perfect. <laughs> I love that. Um, Dion, um, can you share like what... Um, and how God has been working amongst young people um, in South Africa in the youth work that you're doing. Yeah, if you've never been to South Africa, you need to come. It's I'm South African, Dion, so yeah. Hey, 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 as I knew, of course I, knew, I would have thought that. Um, now listen, um, we're learning lots. Uh, there are huge challenges. One, one thing I would say, Christine Keynes, right, like there's a hunger and thirst for God. There's a hunger and thirst uh, for what's real. Um, our young people uh, are, first of all, I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm almost 50 years old. I'm going to be 50 years, years old. No in way. Uh, and been involved with youth uh, since I was like 21 or something like that. And, um, and so you've seen things come and go. And, and something Laura said was uh, the information is so available, readily available to everyone, whether you're in a township, whether you're in the suburbs or whatever, wherever you are. Um, and so those are great challenges. Even And, and we you know, 11 official languages, so you would understand the, the, the challenges there. Uh, mm -hmm. One I think uh, I'm learning is not to underestimate um, the importance of relevance, um, mm -hmm. also innocence and purity um, and responsibility. And what I mean by that is, so us as leaders, all the leaders, now we really have to learn to carry responsibility for our young people, um, for their innocence. I think it was a story of Corrie Ten Boom where she's trying to carry a suitcase that her dad asked her to carry. And her dad says, you know, you know she, asked, she asked her dad about sexism. Uh, and he says, well, why don't you pick up this, the suitcase? And she tries and carry it. And it's too heavy for her. Um, and he says, look, I'm going to carry this weight for you till, till you are able, strong enough to carry this. And, uh, and I read that story. I was like, oh, man, that's my job. That's, that's all I need to do is to learn how to protect them and carry them with the information that they have. They, they get the information, but they don't have the maturity to carry the weight of that. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're seeing a lot with, with working with teenagers. They have the information, um, but we need more leaders to carry that weight mm -hmm. for them. Um, and those who do are seeing amazing things that God's doing with the help of the Holy Spirit, of course, but we're seeing um, God move in powerful ways because there's a few, there's a, a lot of leaders that are willing to lay down their lives uh, for them and that's awesome that's true that's incredible and like we're so honored to have you guys here because you guys are truly people that have laid your lives down for youth ministry and young people for many many years um and i just wanted to say thank you thank you for doing what you're doing and thank you for continuing uh 50 50 more years dion really to be honest right. so um, yeah, that's a privilege. um <laughs> What about you, Laura? What are some of the specific challenges and questions you're seeing teens wrestling with today? Mm, yeah, so I think there are two things that I, I see quite a lot. So um, one of them is them trying to work out, because we at Youth of Christ, we've done some research ourselves into young people in, in Britain. And when they think of who God is, they actually think of him, just as was said in the research here around Jesus, quite positively, um, mm. that he's powerful, he's loving, he's caring. We ask young people, what does God think of you? And they say, well, he loves me. Uh, but then they can't equate, so why is there pain? Why is there suffering? Why is there a global pandemic? Why, why are there world, like near world wars? What's, what's going on? with all the, If there's, this is who God is, then why is this happening? Um, and so it comes back to the question for them. And again, it was it was referenced throughout all of this research. 
so sh if, if God is there, show me, show me who he is. Like, is, is he real and does he work? Um, I was sat with a, a young person uh, a week ago and uh, I was doing a Bible study and I hadn't realized that this young person wasn't a Christian and he said, look, I just need you to know I've never touched a Bible before. And I was like, okay, well, let's start there. So I started talking with him. And um, as we did this kind of study through, I said to him at the end, you know, is there anything that I could pray for for you that would help you kind of get into know God? And he was like, I just want to know if he's there. And I think for us as leaders, that's a real challenge because um, my fear, and again, this was said about the church, my fear is that we as leaders and we of the church don't have the courage and don't have the faith to show the next generation the kind of god that that exists and the kind of power that jesus has um i worry that we don't have enough going on in our lives that really means that if jesus doesn't come through for us we fail um and i think we live lives of convenience and of comfort and we don't often pray prayers that really put jesus on the spot and i think that, that this generation is looking for that like if god is big and god can do stuff show me i think the other thing that I see specifically about uh, young people, and this might just be in the UK, uh, but I think there's a real generational divide as well. Um, and I think Gen Z particularly are looking around going, what have you done to our planet? Um, what, what are the political choices that you're making here? What are the things that you guys have voted for that we now have to live with? Um, and so as their leaders and as the church, I think our position in approaching them has to be on our knees and apologising where we have maybe let them down. And that's our starting point. Um, but the church has this beautiful opportunity to bring generations together, to bring healing uh, and speak the love and life of Jesus into that as well. So those are, so those are some of the things Huge. I think I'm looking at. Huge. I, I'm completely convicted and inspired in the same, at the same time, by the way, Laura. And it's just, it's what um, Christine Kane was talking about, like how young people are consistently watching us. So like if we model faith, then then they'll model faith. And it's, it's crazy because you always think that like they're not taking it in, but they have a funny way of actually absorbing the environment and absorbing things like faith and prayer and reading the Bible um, without us even noticing it. So it, you're right. Yeah. Um, it's, it's what example are we setting every single day yeah. for young people? Yeah. Really um, amazing stuff. Thank you, Laura. Um, but Dan, what about you? Um, in, in your work with Alpha, what, does, what doors does a conversational approach open up for reaching this next generation? Yeah, I mean, for starters, I just want to say, Laura and Dion, thank you for that. That was absolute gold. Uh, I'm going to have to rewatch this later just so I can write down exactly what you were just saying. But yeah, I think when it comes to a conversational approach, you gotta, we got to realize that it hasn't always been the way within church. And, you know, so I love the local church. I'm all about the local church. But Sunday services, which tends to be where we put a lot of emphasis, isn't about conversation. It's about you come in and you listen to the preacher. Preacher gives the, the three points. You sit there with your notepad or your, your phone. You take the three points. You go home and that's it. Where young people have got so many questions and they want to have a discussion. They want to have a conversation. They've got like 10 questions on your first point. And so even mm -hmm. if you look at how Jesus, yeah, he was obviously sharing to wider crowds, but then he spent lots of time with his disciples, having discussion, having conversation, going back and forth so that they could go deeper, so that they could mature. And so, you know, I think as we've always done, we need the small group and we need the, the larger gathering. But if we keep putting all the emphasis on the larger gathering about getting them in the room, then they're going to miss out on that space for conversation and discussion. Mm -hmm. And so I think at the moment, like youth ministry in the future might look really different. It might look like instead of them coming to us, it means we, we go to them. It might mean that we're there when they're playing in their sports game. It might be us calling them the night before their exam uh, to pray for them. It might be us going for some food with them the next day to see how the exam went. And the thing with that is that the measurables look very different. You know, you can measure how many people are in the room. You can measure how many people are on the team. You can measure how many, I guess, salvations there were. But, you know, if we're all going out of the room, then the, the metrics are kind of changed. It's not as easy to measure. But I think if we see a generation of um, youth leaders and youth pastors and volunteers who actually do what they can to look after these young people in a conversation and discussion. And, they, and they're not as, um, they don't care so much about the metrics in terms of so that they can put the picture on Instagram, look how full the room is, but they, they just, they don't care about getting glory for self, but they can just do what they can do to look after the young people God's given them to, to look after. Then I think um, that will be a really healthy space that we step into in looking mm. after this. 
I love that, Dan. It's just creating that that yeah. space for conversation for young people to be able to really um, explore deeper, um, which is amazing. And this 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 and um, this time of um, questions with you. Sorry, Dion, were you going to say something? I was as like Dan. That's so it's fire. Um, I think one of the things that we learned uh, during um, the COVID. We, you know, we try to go live on Instagram and do all kinds of entertainment type stuff. And it was, it was such a flop. It was so bad. It was terrible. We couldn't compete with, you know, the, the best of the best. Um, and, what, and the one thing we changed was, was make, making small group part of our church. Um, it's always been, but it became such a focus on building community. And mm-hmm. as Dan was speaking, I was just thinking, man, like, like God's using that more than anything, just doing life with people rather than focusing solely on an event once a week. Yeah, that was, that was fine. Thanks, Dan. Amazing. And in 60 seconds, if you could just inspire us with, you know, what your hope is for this open generation, um, mm. just go for it, all of you. We'd love to hear. You go first, Laura, go on. I wonder whether that would happen. Okay. But I think I would say that this is a generation who carries hope. Uh, they carry a voice. They carry a, a desire and a drive for a brighter future. And I actually think that we, as a generation above them, can learn from them. I think if you, like, if I sit here and think, do I genuinely believe that Jesus can transform this world through a generation? I think, I hope so. But I think our conviction can be stronger than that. And I think we as an old generation have a huge opportunity to be called to account by a younger generation that says, if you really trust Jesus, put your faith where your mouth is. Like, live big, pray big prayers, do big stuff. And I think we've become comfortable. And God is using a generation underneath us to call that out and say, do you trust how big I really am? And so I think what I would say is um, as a leader in this generation, if you spend time with young people who don't know Jesus, don't say no for them, because I think they're much more open than you think they will be if you allow Jesus to do what he can do if you do what you can do. I love that. I'll go next. I'm not sure that that was a minute. I just talked really quick. No, so. no, Laura. <laughs> I'll go next because Dion's told us that he's 50. He's like the Obi-Wan Kenobi <laughs> youth ministry, so I want to end on him. Uh, yeah. So um, the, I'm, I'm 30, 37, and I started the ministry when I was 18. So that's nearly two decades of youth ministry. And I remember at Bible College when I was 18 years old, uh, they said uh, when we're looking at youth ministry, young people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And it's funny because here we are 20 years later, and one of the stats was like young people uh, don't don't care about so much the, the social media or the influencer. They they want like to hear what the Bible says. They want to hear what a pastor says. They want a relationship. And that's that's the thing. And so I just think um, let's just keep building relationship with young people, knowing that through relationship, they'll know that we care. And then we know we care. They might actually one day want to know, you know, what we know. Yeah. Uh, I th- that's awesome. Uh, I think for me, uh, Christianity is not a spectator sport. It's a mm-hmm. participant thing. It's a team game. Uh, let's trust our young people that God's called them. They, they've got a, the mission is theirs too. Um, and, you know, they're going to reach their friends better than we could ever do. Um, yeah. So let's, like, as old as this, equip them. Let's be passionate about getting them ready. Let's walk a walk with them. Uh, through their 20s into their 30s, whatever, whatever, however long it takes, let's get them ready. Um, and I think, they, I think they're awesome. I think they, they're going to do some stuff that's going to be way better than we've ever come up with. Um, and let's be patient. I, I think there's a, a verse in Proverbs that says, you know, like the only clean stable is an empty stable. Um, so if you want to have an ox that's strong, Whoa. you're going to have to clean up a missile too. So let's go, you know. Wow, 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 wow. Thank you so much, guys. Um, it's been an honor. We've loved this panel. We're going to rewatch it. Um, you guys have been great. Oh, Thank you. Oh man, Azan, that was a. I was in the green room. I was kind of backstage here and just listen. I was looking through all the Q and A, right? And because we're we're starting to get low on time here as we end our our webinar, but like you guys were like actually answering the questions just as you were going naturally. So. I know there's a lot of questions in the Q&A and we don't have time to get to all of them, but I do want to, to ask you one, Phil uh, asked this question, like on, practic- pra- on a practical ministry level, like something that you heard today, you know, from a stat or an insight or something that was shared, did, did any like practical ministry ideas emerge for you or maybe things you're already doing right now say like, hey, we're directly like what we're doing in ministry is directly addressing that stat or that issue. Did, it, did anything come to mind for any of you? 
I mean, I went first last time, so Dan, surely you're uh, you're up now. <laughs> yeah, or I'd say one thing that we're doing is they think that Jesus was crucified. So young people are saying that he was crucified, that he died, but they don't believe that he had a personal relationship with him. And they don't believe that he's active in the world today. I think when I look at youth ministry over the last 20 years of my experience, we always preach the gospel, which is great. We always tell them that he died and rose again. But maybe it's time for not just the preachers and the olders to be saying it, but to just give the mic to the young people so they can just share with their friends about how they have a personal relationship with Jesus and how they see him active today. So I think yeah, one of the practical things we can do is keep giving the mic to the young people. Yeah. Dion, when you when you think about giving the mic to a young person, there's a lot of older people in the room that be like, kind of cringe, like, oh, what, well, what happens if they don't say the right thing? Or what if their theology is not quite right? How do you walk? How do you give this generation the mic, but still disciple them through those opportunities? Because to Dan's point, like, that's a great opportunity for us to learn from them. But I also yeah. think it's a great opportunity to disciple them along the way. Yeah, yeah. I think I think one of the dangers is that we we make ministry about a stage, you know, and a platform. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think in my own life, like a stage has been the most dangerous place for me, for my soul, for my heart, for my walk with God. <laughs> so I, I think I think when I think about a, a, giving a young person a platform, I think it's in a small group. I think it's in yeah. community. I think it's in with, with leaders that love them for real, that want to see them win and succeed. Uh, and I think if we do life together, then we can talk about those things. You know, the, the real question that you want to ask. Um, then the platform comes later because you want to you want to see. Because ultimately, like our walk is character as well. You know, like we have to have is a is a character development. And Jesus was like hidden for thirty years before he had public ministry. So it's like if he took that long to be public, you know, where am I? Maybe at sixty years old. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. But you know, it's, it's I think. I think the truth. I think if we're gonna we're gonna share this walk with him. Let's let's do it in a, like the reality of that as well. Yeah, that's a good word. Sometimes there's a literal mic that we need to give give them. Yeah, Sometimes yeah. it's more of a figurative, 100%. proverbial mic, right? But either way, like we need to disciple them in their character and their hearts. That's a great word, Dion. Hey, Laura, I, any I will say for Dan, oh, Go ahead. Sorry, to Dan's point, they can do it better than any older person, though. Like they all relate to their, their friends way better than than I would. Or anyone else. Yeah. Yeah. Laura, any practical insights that come out of today as we close? Yeah. Do you know, I was thinking, I was just looking, I was scribbling frantically as, uh, as all the stats are being sort of read out. So I've got a pen in my hand. But um, Dan said some really interesting stuff around the bridging the gap between, I say I'm a Christian, I'm a committed Christian. And those, I think those five things that, that Dan mentioned um, relevant community, mission, purpose, impact, I think it would be really interesting to this is who I am. So maybe it's not that interesting. It's interesting for me to, to create almost for your own ministry, like a, a checklist of am I, is, is the ministry I'm creating within my local setting hospitable to grow these things, to help transition young people from a commitment or a nominal commitment to being a, a dedicated follower of Jesus? You know, uh, well, how am I creating that community? Am I giving young people opportunity for mission? What am I speaking into about their purpose? I think there's a really interesting even in terms of the practical teaching that you do, um, little checklist there to say, is this what I'm creating? Am I fostering an environment mm. to grow followers of Jesus? Yeah, that checklist. That's a great idea. Just really practical. Have it there always and, and filter a lot of what you're doing through that that checklist. That's Those are great yeah. insights, Laura. Hey, thank you so much, uh, Laura, Dion, Dan, for joining us. By the way, there's a lot of research questions or research-based questions uh, that we didn't have time to get to. Um, what I would say is if you want to stick around for a little bit, Daniel can maybe answer some of those in the chat. We'll maybe leave the webinar open for about five minutes. He can answer some of those if you want, if you want to stick around. You can also go to opengeneration.info and we have a ton of uh, research resources there. You can go through and get a, you can dive really deep into uh, more of the research. And I think a lot of your questions can get answered there. So go to opengeneration.info.